All right, the seminar for Andy Hazelton's DTC Visitor Project. Uh, Dr. Andy Hazelton is an associate scientist with the University of Miami Cooperative Institute for Marine and Atmospheric Studies, working with NOAA AOML's Hurricane Research Division. Andy works on HAVS model development, testing, and evaluation, including model physics development, real-time testing, and developing graphical products for HAFS. Andy also participates in the HRD field program uh, to collect observations that are used for model initialization, evaluation, and research. Andy received his bachelor's, master's, and PhD from Florida State University and did a postdoc with Princeton University GFDL before coming to Miami. On a personal note, he shared that he enjoys hiking, which has made this visit to Boulder very enjoyable. And then finally, I just wanted to add from the DTC that we've really enjoyed having Andy here for this project. Um, not only does he bring his TC experience, um, but also his enthusiasm to interface between the broader developer, physics developer community and the HAVS community has been really great. And we've learned a lot, and I think he's helping lay the framework um, or the groundwork to be able to do additional cross-application physics studies. So that's been really exciting. And before I hand it over to Andy, I just wanted to mention that um, unless you have an urgent clarification question, if we could hold questions until the end of the presentation, that'd be great. So with that, um, go ahead, Andy. All right, thank you, Catherine. Yeah, I'm excited to be here, excited to share um, some of been working on over the last um, year, um, basically talking about um, a, a variety of topics um, that we've worked on um, related to be able to better forecast um, TC structure and large-scale steering. And um, so I'd obviously like to thank um, Catherine and Weiwei for being great hosts, and also um, our other collaborators um, who have helped with various aspects and, and given some good ideas um, for, for um, ongoing and future work. So just to kind of give an overview, um, our AOML model development has mostly focused on high-resolution hurricane applications, um, specifically HAFs. Um, and so we've you know, modified and um, evaluated physics parameterizations based on the tools that we've developed at AOML, like um, large eddy simulations and observations. And, and I'll show, um, I mean, I'll do a brief background showing a little bit of that. Um, but it's, it's interesting and worthwhile to go beyond HAFs and see how these model physics changes behave across a variety of applications and scales. Kind of um, part of that, goal of unified physics within the unified forecast system. Um, and, and this type of analysis will also help motivate further optimization of physics, you know, not just for one application, but to be able to span a variety of applications and scales. Um, and this is really um, directly applicable to the TC problem because tropical cyclones um, really, you know, span a variety of scales ranging from micro, um, you know, microphysics to synoptic and, and even subseasonal. So, um, you know, to get TCs right, you really need to be able to get the physics right across a variety of scales. So just a brief outline, um, we're going to have kind of a um, s some somewhat separate but connected um, avenues of research exploring physics behavior across scales. So I'll start with a background on a little bit of what we've done um, in the HAFS physics development um, and then get into what I did for the project, which is um, a comparison of HAFS with um, UFS short range weather application for Hurricane Laura then um, analysis of HAFS forecast using um, a modification to the convective scheme known as Frog Sigma. And finally, we're going to look at um, uh, some GFS forecast that we did using a modified PBL scheme um, for hurricane applications to see how it did on the large scale. So just to start with a little bit of background on um, uh, kind of the work on HAFS physics that's been ongoing at AOML. Um, so a few years ago, we started by looking at some of the um, PBL schemes in HAFS and looking at um, the eddy diffusivity and, and then the mixing length, um, specifically in the EDF TKE scheme, um, both the default version and then making some modifications based on observations. Um, so that, you know, the, the green is kind of the default um, EDMF scheme in GFS, and then the, the blue is the default EDF TKE. This is eddy diffusivity as a function of wind speed. Um, and so the observation showed that both of these were a little bit too diffusive. So we made some modifications. Um, the red is the modification that was done um, in HWARF a while back, um, just using kind of a, a constant um, sort of tuning term. And then we made a kind of a similar modification in EDF TKE to cap the mixing length to basically get less mixing, more realistic eddy diffusivity, um, and stronger cyclones. Um, and that, those results are, were published um, in a paper that came out last year. Um, but this was sort of a, you know, just a very coarse, um, you know, first way of doing it. Um, so a much, uh, kind of a better way of, of make, of doing the, modifying the scheme was introduced um, by our collaborator, Xiaomin Chen, at, uh, who's now at uh, the University of Alabama, Huntsville. Um, and he used large eddy simulations basically to um, simulate realistic hurricane environments and then make modifications to um, you know, a variety of schemes, but um, specifically we're looking at EDMF, EDMF TKE. Um, so you, you can evaluate this at different uh, wind radii or different um, radii in the storm and basically improve the mixing length and um, 
to precipitate different things based on our jetty simulations um, involving, like I said, changes to the mixing length, the mass flux, and others. Um, and so we implemented this in halves, um, and it's known as the TCPBL option. Um, so it's in the UFS repository, and it's basically to provide a more realistic um, hurricane-like uh, boundary layer settings. And then we, so, um, we then took that and ran um, the 2021 season basically in parallel um, a version of halves with that. Um, that's the, uh, the, the red here where blue is the default halves A for that season and red was the, the halves Y, which is with this uh, PBL modification, um, produced stronger and deeper tropical cyclones, driven, you can see here, by stronger boundary layer inflow. Um, you get greater transport of momentum inward. And as a result, you get, um, you get, uh, you get a stronger storm. But um, you can see that um, you know, this, is just, this is just for hurricanes. This is not for any kind of um, large scale application. And so um, we're, what we're gonna do um, then, we wanna take this and see how these physics changes um, go perform across a variety of scales. Um, so we're gonna look at um, Hurricane Laura, um, 2020. Um, this was one of the first, um, this was one of the first evaluations we did uh, because the HAFS applications had a notable left bias that you'll see in a second. And so we wanted to compare with the, uh, the UFS short range weather application run at th three kilometer and 13 kilometer resolution. Um, we use, and we're gonna look at two physics configurations of halves, um, one of which is similar to halves A, um, using the GFDL microphysics. Um, one that's similar to halves B, which is using the Thompson microphysics, but no PBL changes. Um, so these are the SRW configurations we're looking at. Um, so for the Hurricane Laura uh, case, this is, uh, we initialized it at 20, uh, August 20th at 20, uh, August 25th of, of 2020. So the, the Oops, sorry, the, uh, the orange and the green here are the two half um, simulations that we ran. And then the um, green and the purple are HWARF and HMOD, so sort of our default um, operational uh, hurricane models at the time. So these are, the, these are sort of the real-time runs from 2020. Um, so you can see that um, basically both versions of halves were, were much too far to the left. So that was sort of a you know, problem we noticed in real time. Um, and you know, the version with the Thompson microphysics was maybe a little bit better. So then we um, added on the, uh, the UFS um, short range weather application forecast. You can see um, the red and the blue here are the, the, the three kilometer versions, then 13 kilometer versions are here in the pink and the blue. Um, so you could see that um, basically what was interesting was that the 13 kilometer versions had a better, um, better track forecast, although you know, they, were, they were obviously too weak, as you can see on the right, which is not surprising um, given the, the scales here. But it was just interesting that you know, the physics it seemed like the, the physics actually behaved better in terms of the track forecast for the higher or the lower resolution model here, which is kind of uh, surprising. So to look at maybe the, a little bit of the synoptic um, reasons for why uh, this, you know, this forecast um, busted, you know, we had this left bias, and we looked at the subtropical ridge height um, in halves and, and compared it with HWARF, which had a better forecast, and then you know, the, the analysis from GFS and um, ERA-5. Um, what was interesting was that the subtropical ridge was actually too weak um, in halves and in HWARF, so you'd, um, you know, you'd think that would have tugged it further to the right, but it looked like there was a difference in this upper level low here to the west of the storm that um, basically um, was responsible, you know, it was too weak, and that's, you know, that's why the halves um, brought the storm in further west. And so it seems like the, you know, these um, different physics at different scales kind of give you very different synoptic results, and that's sort of what was driving this, uh, this difference in track. So just to summarize these, this section of the results, um, the high resolution um, short range weather uh, application the three, at three kilometers um, it showed a similar track bias to half. So all the high resolution models in the UFS sort of had the same bias. Um, and interestingly, you know, changing physics suites here, at least you know, basically using the, the PBL or, or Thompson microphysics, um, didn't really change the track bias. So it implies that there's probably something else in the physics or something else going on. Um, and the difference between the three kilometer and 13 kilometer run suggests that the behavior of um, the convection, you know, because you're gonna have different behavior in the convection at different scales um, at different resolutions, and that that's probably an issue for the track here. So that sort of motivated the next thing that we are, are gonna be looking at, which is um, this sort of so-called prognostic sigma. Um, and what this is, it's a, a new scalar closure scheme for the scalar SAS um, convective scheme that um, was, was uh, developed by Lisa Bingston et al. In, um, in a 2022 paper. And it makes changes to the updraft area, uh, mass flux, and other things. 
Um, and this evaluation focused mostly on the subseasonal, um, which is in that paper focused mostly on the subseasonal. So we're kind of seeing how this performs um, in halves, um, using halves runs of Hurricane Ian in 2022, kind of as a um, as a, a sort of standard evaluation case. And we're going to be using sort of the pre-operational baseline version of HAFS, um, HFSA. So this is sort of very similar to what's going in operations this year. So we'll be looking at both versions, HAFS A and HAFS B. Um, the HAFS A um, is sort of the um, default um, HAFS A. Um, that's just, you know, that's the light blue. And then the dark blue, HFAP, that is the um, run with the prognostic sigma term. Um, there was a, um, so what I have here basically is you have the, you know, your standard track error. Let me see if I get this. There it goes. Standard track error here. Um, then the skill here. Um, so basically the skill of the modified version relative to half A. Um, and then the colors are a consistency metric developed by Sarah Ditchek et al. Um, in 20, uh, a paper that came out last year to basically tell whether the results are, are statistically robust. Um, and then this is all the different cycles to see you know, what the error was like for each of the different cycles. So what you can see is that um, really it's pretty much neutral, I'd say. Um, there's some degradation early for this for Ian and maybe a little bit of improvement late, but, but not, not that much of a difference overall in terms of track. Um, and then for intensity, kind of the same story. You have you know, your absolute error, your skill, um, the bias here, and then you know, each cycle. Um, and there really just wasn't a notable consistent difference. So it's sort of just a neutral result overall. But for HAPS B, on the other hand, the result was pretty different, and that was kind of interesting to see. Um, you had basically um, um, marginal to, to fully consistent improvement in track at all lead times. You could see a lot of that came from these early lead cycles where HAPS, you'll, as you'll see in a minute, HAPS B had a real left bias that was improved by this prognostic sigma term. And there are also some pretty notable differences in intensity. Um, in terms of overall skill, um, it was kind of neutral. Um, the, the bias is very different. Um, Prog Sigma um, produced a stronger storm pretty consistently. Um, you, know, you can see, especially some of those early cycles again, had a, had a much uh, stronger storm, a little bit of a high bias in fact. So it's just interesting to see that HAFS, um, HAFS B had a much stronger um, response to this, um, to this particular physics change. Um, and it may be you know, due to sort of the interaction between the different schemes. Um, and so that looking at some, some specific forecasts, um, you can see that um, uh, September, uh, September 23rd at 12Z, you can see, so I have all four of the, uh, of the tracks and intensity plotted here. So default half A is, is light blue, default half B is magenta, and then you have your, your two modified versions. So you can see that product sigma um, causes a slight left shift for half A and a slight right shift for half B. Both of those are good because it's, it's closer to the observed track. Um, the intensification was also better captured. Um, it's, you know, half B, um, maybe a little bit too much intensification with Prog Sigma, um, but you can see half speed did better on intensity for this cycle overall. Um, and this cycle, um, September 23rd, 18Z, again, you saw sort of Prog Sigma bring that half speed track to the right, closer to reality. As everyone, you may remember, this was sort of a big issue for Ian, you know, some of the forecasts for GFS-based models were off to the left here, so it was encouraging that we brought, were able to bring this to the right. Um, but we did see kind of too much uh, excessive deepening um, with Prog Sigma. So it was sort of uh, bringing the storm up to almost 170 knots, like a yeah, highest, about as high of a Cat 5 as you can get. So maybe a little bit overdone on the intensity side of things. Um, so we're going to look at sort of the storm structure a little bit and dig into this more to sort of um, try to understand why, um, the why is to, um, this was leading to the, the better or the stronger storm. So what we have here is a comparison between the default half speed, the modified version here, and then the uh, um, radar that we collect, um, like Catherine mentioned, I um, fly and collect, help collect observations. So I think this may have been one of the flights I was on or the one after, um, basically radar for this Ian case. So we have um, reflectivity and then wind structure as well. So we have, um, in default half speed, you can see that the eye is a little bit bigger, whereas with the Prog Sigma, you sort of had this tighter spiral that seems a little bit closer to observations, but you know, maybe a little bit too small. Um, you see you have a smaller wind core um, that's able to sort of wind up more quickly. Um, and also, when you have in, in the Prog Sigma version, you have convection sort of focused inside the radius of maximum winds, and, and that tends to uh, focus um, heating and, and lead to a stronger storm. So another way of visualizing this is to look at um, the azimuthal mean. So you have um, you have uh, half speed default version at hours 54 and 60 here. This is kind of when the intensity started to diverge a little bit, um, and then we have the uh, with the prognostic sigma here. Um, you can see that the 
you know, the overall structure is really not that different, but the modified version has a little bit of a tighter, um, smaller inner core that develops, and that's sort of what I think allowed the storm to spin up faster. And, and looking at the uh, tangential wind, um, again, this is azimuthal mean, so averaged around the storm, uh, kind of a standard way of looking at hurricanes. Um, you can see, again, you know, the, the overall structure is, is not that different. Um, you had an, actually had an initially stronger vortex in the default version, but then around hour 60, you had this sort of what well, looks like a bottom up, a very small um, inner core developing, and that small, robust inner core is what allowed the storm to spin up so quickly. And finally, an azimuthal mean plot of vertical velocity. You can see that, um, again, you know, not a ton of differences early, but then at R60, you have this um, very robust updrafts that develop inside the uh, eyewall region um, for prog sigma, and you had weaker intercore updrafts for the default version. And those, so those stronger vertical velocities are gonna get you more heating and also more inflow of, of air to the, uh, to the, into the eyewall region, smaller intercore, you know, faster wind up, all this leading to basically to a stronger storm. So, Physically, it's consistent with, with what we were seeing in the intensity, but just maybe a little bit overdone. And, and similar, um, looking at plan view again, you know, the reflectivity, overall structure is the same, but you know, I notice um, with prognostic sigma, you kind of get less of this sort of popcorn convection out at outer radii and more sort of rain band focus convection in the inner core. So it's definitely, you know, it, as you'd expect when you're making a, a significant modification to the convective scheme, you are seeing some rather different convective characteristics in the storm. So to sort of see if we could um, maybe modify the prog sigma a little bit to get to tune it down so it doesn't overdo this intensification so much, we worked on a modification that to a couple of the tuning parameters that basically sort of control the, the mass flux and the, you know, sort of the, the grid area, um, and because it seems like it's very sensitive to the mass flux. And by doing this, we were able to notably reduce the over-intensification, but you can see the purple to the uh, dark red here. Um, so, you know, it's interesting that just how sensitive um, the physics really are to this uh, parameterized mass flux, and, and that's something I think that'll be important to think about going forward. So just to summarize this part, um, like I said, there was not much change to the half-say forecast with the uh, modified scale awareness calculation. Um, Half's B was a little bit more, actually a lot more sensitive on intensity. Um, we saw an improved track, um, probably because of the, some of the large scale improvements that uh, we saw with the prog sigma, you know, less of this popcorn convection but then also excessive intensification because um, you had you know, maybe a little too much or too small of an inner core. Um, it seems like maybe the, the PBL changes and the Thompson microphysics in HAPS B, um, maybe you're interacting a little bit more with the, uh, the prog sigma term and you know, it's overall just kind of winding up the storm a little bit too much. Um, and so it seems like um, tuning the mass flux um, basically, um, which we saw you know, modifying the mass flux in the convective scheme made a big difference. So I think it's what this really illustrates is that it's important to understand how the cumulus, PBL, and microphysics all interact with each other as we go forward and, and think about unified physics and, and um, you know, not just treating schemes individually, but sort of holistically together. Um, so the last set of, of experience we did was sort of to go beyond, a little bit beyond just hurricanes and look at um, how the modified PBL physics that I talked about, the TC PBL option, um, does on a, sort of a large scale. So we did this using the GFS. Um, I'd like to thank um, Kate Friedman at, uh, and, and Mallory Rowe at EMC both for help in setting up and then um, you know, doing some post-processing of this um, or evaluation. Um, so there's one set of GFS runs that uses default physics. Um, I think that's you know, in the current GFS, GFDL microphysics and that kind of thing. Um, and then we did another run of set of runs with just uh, where we just switched to using the TCPBL option like is in HAFS B. Um, we did, for both of these sets of runs, we used the GFDL microphysics, like what's in the current operational GFS, just so we could sort of isolate the, the PBL impacts. Um, we did uh, C384, so 25 kilometer grid spacing, um, just for the sake of time, because we wanted to run a whole month. We basically did the entire month of September 2022, so there were, there were some hurricanes globally, but also just look at sort of the large scale um, effects. And then we used uh, sort of the EMC um, ver global verification tools to, uh, to evaluate it. So the first thing I'm going to do, since it's, you know, we're introducing a PBL difference, you'd expect some PBL changes, and sure enough, um, the PBL is, is um, with the modifications, which are in red, the PBL is, is shallower, you know, you have less mixing is what this does, and so, you know, that's sort of consistent with what we'd expect. Um, in terms of some of our standard metrics for um, how the, uh, how the um, large scale is affected, we looked at fi first 500 millibar anomaly correlation over the globe, um, which is um, sort of, um, 
you know, sort of one of the standard metrics. And we basically saw that you, you know, it was generally the same, but we did see a little bit of degradation um, at starting around day three that maybe got a little bit worse at, at longer leads, although you know, the sample size wasn't as large there. Um, 200 millibars or 250, kind of the same thing. Um, you were just curious if this is just one level, but now it looks like large scale, you know, do you see a little bit of degradation using this modification, um, you know, at long, especially at longer lead times. Um, but what's interesting is then when you look at some sort of surface metrics, um, for example, this is the dew point over the eastern United States, um, and, you know, it's sort of, I think, you know, the GFS um, overmixing and, and drying is sort of something that's well known. And it seems like this uh, modification actually did improve that. You see kind of a smaller um, negative bias in dew point, so dew points that are closer to reality. So it seems like by the, this um, reduced mixing that we introduced with the hurricane problem also did improve this um, surface problem over the eastern U.S., but then it sort of degraded some of the upper air metrics. So it, it's really hard to get this everything right at the same time. Um, just to look at um, how this impacted sort of TCs on a lower resolution, we looked at track um, in the Atlantic, East Pacific, and West Pacific. You can see, you know, the Atlantic had a decent sample, and the West Pacific, East Pacific, a little bit smaller. Um, so again, um, you know, pretty neutral track results overall, maybe a little bit of degradation in the Atlantic, um, especially at days um, three, two, three, and four. So that might be consistent with that slight um, anomaly correlation degradation that we saw as well. Um, but then the West Pacific, you kind of had a, a longer range, you actually had a little bit of improvement. So, you know, the sample size isn't, isn't as good, but, you know, basically neutral results overall, I would say, on track. Um, so just to summarize uh, this part of the evaluation, um, we looked at the, the TC-specific PBL modifications um, and, and plug it into the GFS and see what happens. Um, we saw mixed results, um, kind of the standard large-scale evaluation metrics had some degradation, um, especially at longer lead times. Um, but the PBL height and then other, you know, kind of surface-related metrics like the dew point showed improvement. Um, and so that was sort of a mixed bag. Um, and then you know, the TC track forecast was also a mixed bag. So again, it really points to the need to optimize these things across a variety of scales and look at different metrics and see if, you know, there are ways we can sort of not just get this one number right, you know, but, you know, what are, what are ways we can modify the scheme to, to get as much of this right at the same time as possible? Um, so just to overall conclusions, um, these sort of, they're three related but separate aspects of the project and sort of they all show a similar theme. Um, model physics can have a very different behavior for TCs um, across a variety of scales and applications. Um, we saw, um, we saw that, you know, in, in the uh, test for Hurricane Laura where the three kilometer and 13 kilometer runs produce you know, very different track outcomes. And so, you know, the model physics and how it behaves across scales is something we really need to understand better. Um, and the representation of cumulus convection um, and, and how that sort of tapers off as you go down to higher resolution um, continues to be a challenge, um, and that's something we're continuing to look at. Um, and then the, the TC-specific PBL changes we found also improve some of the sort of land-based surface evaluation metrics that are directly related to the boundary layer, but then degraded some of the upper-level metrics. Um, and so the kind of one overarching theme that we took from this is that interactions between different parameterizations and you know, different scales, it's an area that needs to be better understood for TC prediction, and not just, you know, sort of modifying the boundary layer or modifying the convection, but how do these interact together? So for our future work, um, we're going to continue to explore how different physics schemes interact within halves, um, both for large-scale track prediction and also storm structure prediction. Um, so we're going to, um, one thing we're going to wanting to do is assess the performance of prognostic sigma across a larger set of cases. Um, and compare with other convective schemes like the Tidiki scheme and, and the, or the Grofredos, which we're working to try to get in halves. And what this, what we're hoping to do with this is obviously improve the forecast, but also to increase diversity between halves A and halves B, because in a lot of our um, sort of re retrospective testing, we find that halves A and B are, you know, more, maybe a little bit more similar than the HWARF and HMON models were. And we'd like to sort of increase that diversity and also improving um, skill, obviously, especially for forecasts of rapid intensification and, you know, and challenging things like that. And then we're also going to look at the um, unification of mass flux. I, you know, as we saw, the mass flux is a really sensitive term in the convection. So I have a, a project, um, there's a project led by Jamin that I'm uh, going to be on in the second year that's going to be looking at how to unify that between the convection and, and the PBL scheme, and, and hopefully we'll get some uh, answers out of that. And also um, we're going to be um, evaluating how physics behave in a basin scale configuration of halves. This is something we're, being de uh, we're developing at AOML. Uh, basically where we'll hopefully have a, a larger outer domain where you have multiple moving nests, multiple hurricanes interacting together. And so, 
when you have multiple hurricanes interacting in, in a larger outer domain, the physics really needs to behave well at both the large and the small scales to get the forecast right. And so you know, that's sort of one um, really important application of this project. So that's all I have, and I will be happy to take any questions now. So oh, any questions? I, we're pretty light in the room, but it um, sounds like there's a number of people online. So um, if you can use the Slido to ask some questions. Is there any? I had some questions. I'm sorry if I missed it, but the lack of sensitivity to the prod sigma for which that was for the... That was the GFDL microphysics, right? Correct. So like the settings for the prod sigma, if you change the settings, since you showed some sensitivities that maybe it's just not as, as sensitive for if you use the same sig sig prod sigma settings with that microphysics and the other, would it, do you think it would change? I don't That's know. That's a good question because we, I think we actually kind of, the, the, the change we did in half B was to tune the mass flux down a little bit because it was overactive. Maybe if you tune it up here, it would be the opposite. That's you know, we didn't try that, but that's a good idea. Um, it certainly seems like yeah, different microphysics and different PBL. You know, because with um, with the TC PBL option in half B, you're getting more. I think you're probably getting a little bit stronger mass flux as well. So yeah, the, getting this to interact correctly is it's definitely like an iterative process. But I, that would be interesting to look at. Yeah, so I have some comic like better with Thomson microphysics compared to GFDL microphysics, but I'm not sure if that's the case really in the code. So maybe just go back to check the code of microphysics to see how Prox Sigma is hooked up with those microphysics. Yeah, that would be a good idea because it definitely seems like at least in terms of sensitivity, have to be, or with, have to, or the, with Thomson it's a lot more sensitive. So, you know, maybe that's, you know, I'm not sure if it's an error or just, you know, Different schemes interacting, but that would definitely be good to check on how they're how they're talking to each other. All right, we do have a couple of questions online. Um, so the first one is from Zhang Hun Shin. Um, so very interesting presentation for three kilometer and thirteen kilometer resolution experiments. Have you tested it for other cycles of LoRa case? Do you know? Did you find that the thirteen kilometer resolution experiment produced a better track for other cycles? You know, we actually just looked at this one cycle, but that would be really interesting to see. Um, this, you know, yeah, because I mean, you can't tell, get too much definitive conclusions from just one cycle. Um, but, you know, we saw not just from this experiment, but, you know, we saw behavior at different scales across a variety of different tests within this, uh, within this project. Then the next question, actually, I was, I was wondering if you looked at this or not. But so uh, Zach Zhang said, did the Prog Sigma scheme have better RI forecast skills compared to the default half speed? Um, yes and no. Like I said, we just looked at Ian for this project, and it seemed like it had better RI detection, but a little bit worse uh, RI, like it, it overdid it a couple times. So that's one reason why we're wanting to run over a larger set of cases and, and see how it does, you know, get some more, more definitive statistics. Because it definitely seems like it's better at doing RI. So like it, it's more sensitive. And, and, you know, so you're going to get better RI detection. You just have to make sure you don't get too much RI. We'll, we'll do Luland's next. So, uh, Lulin Shu asks, uh, it is interesting to see the modified PBL improves the surface matrix, but reduces the skill in the high level. I wonder what mechanism leads to this high level change. Yeah, Lulin, that's a really good question. I, I've, because I've thought about the same thing, and I don't have an easy answer off the top of my head. My guess is kind of what I was talking about that it's related to how the convective scheme and the PBL are inter interacting, that maybe the mass fluxes in the convective scheme are not optimized with how the PBL is behaving. So you're, you're improving the mixing in the, the boundary layer, but then it's not being correctly translated upward would be my guess. And maybe leading to, I don't know if an imbalance is the right word, but just the, the boundary layer and the upper atmosphere don't seem to be communicating correctly. So, and you know, it's not a huge change, but it's definitely there. And so that's something that hopefully this project that Xiaomen and I are gonna be working on will be able to improve that a little bit. So Andy, uh, which physics suite did you use for the for this modified PBL? Uh, for the GFS, I, I basically just still use the um, GFS V17. So it was the, uh, yeah, like the Prototyping. GFDL microphysics. Um, so because we wanted to sort of isolate how the Thompson with and without the PBL changes and see if, if that's different. 
Yeah, because I remember this T TCPBL basically modifies some entryment um, around the BBL top, right? Yeah, well, it's, it's modifying the mass flux, which is going to be related to that as well. So, um, and, and the mixing length, and yeah, so it's going to have sort of different, it's going to have, a, you know, effects on a variety of things. Is there any skill sensitive, sensitivity to uh, for this TCPBL modification? Scale sensitivity? Yeah, skill aware. That's a good question, probably, because um, we originally developed it at uh, three kilometers. Um, that Those tests that I showed at the beginning were three kilometers and then two kilometers, so it seems like it's maybe a little bit more sensitive. Um, like the other thing we're working on that we need to tune is it, it produces um, the outer wind radii are a little bit too small, so it seems like, you know, that we're actually working on, um, Jamin has a paper that's in, I think, in review that is working on a fix to that. Um, and so, yeah, it definitely seems like um, there is a little bit of, yeah, two kilometers, maybe it, it's a little overactive in some ways. Yeah, because I see what, you, uh, what you're using here is 25 kilometer grid spacing. Yeah. So maybe it could affect some, some yeah, of the Yeah, so it's, it's probably not optimized, you know, you would need to be further tuned for GFS. So that's like where it gets to an interesting question of like, how unified is unified, you know, if you have to tune team, um, that's, you know, a step in the right direction at least, so. So in your future work, you mentioned that you're looking also at, I know you've looked at GF and then the TICA scheme. Have, do you have any, you know, have, have you found any results there as far as how those are performing? Yeah, so the, um, the TDK scheme um, in some really preliminary tests that we did um, looked really, it looked really good in the, for the Ian test, like it was get, doing better track. Um, and, and really just, it seemed like it was most different from the others. Um, uh, GF, we're still kind of optimizing, um, but you know, the plan, I think we're, we're hoping to use the, the TDK scheme for our HFIP real time, and then we're gonna also run some proximal runs in parallel and sort of just evaluate, you know, and probably go back after the season, run some retros, and sort of just evaluate for maybe the next year's kind of second implementation of halves, you know, maybe using one of these modifications um, because, yeah, we wanna get something that's better skill and also different from half say, so. Any other questions? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I, I do have a question. I'm just curious, on synoptic scale, you mentioned the subtropical high is too weak, and you said it's a common bias. Is it related to FE3 dynamical core? Or? I don't think so, because the GFS had this problem um, even back before the uh, FE3 change in 2017, I think it was, or, yeah. Um, yeah, GFS has had a problem with, um, you know, and a lot of global models, but GFS especially, with the storms going too far right and the great subtropical ridge of Bermuda high breaking down, we've noticed it for a long time. Um, it seems like it's probably tied to the um, convective scheme, um, and this, the scale over SAS seems to have this this issue. Um, and I think uh, Kuhn Gao from GFDL gave a talk where he showed that there are there is some sensitivity in the, uh, you know, to some of the um, dynamical core. Um, like the uh, diffusion terms and things like that, but it's it's all related to convection and how much convection is produced. So I think that you know, the fact that we've seen this for a long time, um, you know, kind of points at the the convective scheme maybe uh, playing a role. And hopefully that's another reason why we're you know we try a different convective scheme in halves this year, and we we'll see if we get different results, and maybe that'll give us a hint as to what's going on. But, yeah. All right. Thank you. All right, we have another question online from Jimmy Dudia. So, or I guess it's a, a comment. For GFS, you will probably need to look at other biases to see if you can attribute it to the convective scheme over oceans, for example. Yeah, I think that's kind of what I was, was just alluding to with the, uh, it seems like the, the convective scheme over the ocean maybe is a little bit too active in some of these subtropical high regions, and that can lead to sort of the breakdown of, of the high and, and this right bias that we see in some forecasts. else. All right, well, if there's nothing else, then let's uh, thank Andy again. Thank you. And thanks to those who joined online. Um, and yeah. <laughs> thanks, everyone.